Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, firstly, thank you, Tony, for your very kind uh, uh, welcome. Um, funnily enough, why Allah is, is why I live in Australia. Now, you may wonder, that's a bit odd, but I was taken on by my firm that I've long since left, 40 years ago, uh, as a young design engineer to design the mechanical services and basically steward the water services for the Wyala Structural Mill. Now, I don't know if the Wyala Structural Mill is still here or not, but uh, my first visit to Australia was four years later. I had a, a then a 12-day-old baby, which I'd never seen in England, um, and I was on my way back, but of course you couldn't miss Wyala on the way. Uh, we got stuck in the mud, uh, stuck in the sand out there. Luckily, I knew that where the Southern Cross was, so we managed to find our way back, got to the road, thumbed a lift in, and that was history. Next day I went to the steelworks, and I said, well, how do these hydraulic systems really work, the control systems? So, and a chap said, uh, and bear in mind I'm a POM, if you hadn't picked it up already, I was one. Uh, he said, well, mate, he said, it works brilliantly. But I don't know who designed these, uh, these little control desks. Now, I, I, a midget couldn't work. There's no way you could get a spanner in here to fix the thing up. Um, and I said, look, that's probably number one important lesson I've learned in engineering. I was the designer. Oh, he said, I'm really sorry. I said, don't worry, because that's how life is. So that's, that's my only experience with Wyala until a few years ago, uh, my wife and I came here, and every time we've been looked after absolutely wonderfully. Now, after I've spoken tonight, my guess is that that may all change. So, uh, <laughs> so here, we, here, we, here we go. And I'm also conscious, uh, one, a couple of things I'd like to say. One is, I do know that nuclear energy is, for some people, still uh, a troublesome issue. Uh, uh, secondly, I was part of a, a task force. What I say tonight very broadly does follow, and I'm just going to put up the, uh, the that, that's more or less the index of the task force report. I'm going to be speaking as myself, Martin Thomas, so any views that I give or infer, while they may be shared by the task force, uh, I will take full responsibility for them. Uh, so there we go. Now what you're looking at is the index of the report. This is the report. Uh, it's 285 pages of very closely written stuff. You're all very welcome to read it, but it is a bit of speed reading as it goes round. I'll just start with this. But look, I would like to say this. If any of you feel you haven't got time tonight to read it, but you would like a, a real hard copy, not a downloaded, it's on the website, um, give me a card or any piece of paper with your mailing address on it, and I'll make sure that a copy is sent to you. And for the university, if um, you, you wanted, say, five copies or ten copies, that can all be done. It was paid for by you, the taxpayers, and you deserve to have the outcome if you wish. Well, now, you've all read what you can see on the screen, so I'll move straight on. Uh, the nuclear fuel cycle... Um, um, basically... Uh, this is what we do in Australia, which is uh, mining and milling. Uh, there are three sites we do it at at the moment, uh, Ranger, Olympic Dam, Beverly, two in your state. Uh, conversion is a matter, is, is offshore, done in a number of countries. Uh, the, the plant I saw is Canada, where it's sent to Europe. Uh, Can you I'll carry it? this around with me, because I know I've got a bad speech. Um, turn to uranium hexafluoride, then we go through to enrichment, and I'll show you some details of how that's done, where the 0.7% naturally occurring uranium-235 uh, becomes uh, about 35 to 5% uh, enriched. Um, it can be enriched considerably more, and I'll come to that later as well, but for power purposes, uh, 35 to 5% is what we do. Uh, it's then made into fuel fabricated into pellets, and in a second I'll pass a couple of those pellets around to you. Then a fairly conventional power plant, and again I'll go through that in the, in the presentation, making electricity. Uh, as Stuart uh, pointed out in his water use, the implication of that slightly higher water use than for coal is that the steam cycle is, is not as high steam conditions as, uh, as they are for a modern PF fired plant. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it does use rather more water for cooling. Uh, and then we go to the issues that do worry people quite a bit, spent fuel storage. And we do use the word spent, but it's not really spent. It can be recycled, and we'll show you that in a second. Um, but 
certainly when it comes out of the reactor, it is hot, nasty stuff. It's hot physically and it's hot radioactively. And it's kept in pools about 30 meters deep for uh, 20 to 30 years or so. Uh, and it does glow green in the dark, yes, and I've looked at it. You're fairly safe because uh, a meter of water is quite a protection enough, but 30 meters makes you feel more comfortable. Then eventually we come to the stage where we either recycle it, and this is a hugely expensive process. There are four such plants in the world. They're billion dollar or billion pound or multi-billion pound plants, and uh, the, the uranium which hasn't been used can be uh, converted back or recycled. And as I think most of you probably know, with the present fuel cycles, this Gen 3, the pressurized water reactors and so on, uh, very small portion of the uranium is used. When we go to Gen 4, the fast breeder reactors, we can use, we can get 60 times the amount of energy out of the same uranium. Uh, however, eventually we do have to d dispose of the high level waste, and I'll come to that in a moment with some, some diagrams of how it's done. That's the thing that does worry people. I, as an engineer, feel that there is an engineering solution to that, which is what most countries are, will be adopting, and if Australia does go nuclear, of course, uh, we certainly will do that. So that's the nuclear fuel cycle. Now the Umpton process, uranium mining processing and nuclear energy uh, process, there was a feeling, I think, a uh, somewhat cynical feeling in the public that this was a set up by the government. Well, I can assure you it wasn't. The six of us who came on all said to each other on day one, uh, did you know about this? I certainly didn't. I had very little knowledge of nuclear. I've got a lot of knowledge of energy, I think, and probably more on the renewables side because I ran a corporate research center for it. But um, now I came on fairly blind but very interested that this was a low emission technology and it was worth investigating. Uh, I was the only engineer on the group. There were six, uh, six of us in all, uh, an economist, a couple of nuclear physicists, and, uh, and one um, uh, radiation specialist. And it was a very interesting group, and we were very well supported by, uh, by about 12 quite young public servants who came from a raft of different, uh, of different um, uh, departments. So it was very broad, broadly based, but there was certainly no setup about it. And the questions we were asked were essentially to be factual, objective, and non, uh, 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 not approach the thing with a sense of advocacy. We're not trying to prove anything. At the end of the day, you, the people, have to choose, not us. We were simply there to put the facts on the table. Now, we did encourage public contributions, and they were made through the website, through mail, snail mail, every form, including a great number of face-to-face -face inter interviews. And uh, they spanned a whole raft of different people, of different views, the fors, the against, and so on. And in one, one particular rather interesting day, which perhaps was not characteristic, we saw within a couple of hours of each other, we saw uh, Mr. Hugh Morgan, one, and uh, Mrs. Sharon Burrow, the other, and I think one would have to say that those two individuals might represent uh, the remote ends of the political spectrum in Australia, and we saw everybody else in between. So we were very wide, very Catholic uh, in listening, and we listened to everybody, uh, and we read every uh, submission we got. Uh, we travelled overseas to um, the countries you can see there on the slide. Uh, in case there was any questioning about what Chernobyl was like, that was the one country I didn't go to. We split at that point because I wanted to see what the Brits were doing in Sellafields and Springfield and Capenhurst, uh, which I didn't, which was intensely interesting, but some did go to uh, Chernobyl, a very sad place. Uh, all those other countries are there for you to see, including Three Mile Island and Yucca Mountain. We delivered our draft by November, and that was, that was quite well written up in the press, Delhi and so on, uh, by Ziggy Switkowski at the press gallery, and we delivered the final report, the one that's moving around, by the end of December. So it was six months hard, and it was 24-7 much at that time, and it was a very great privilege to be a member of it. So that's what we did. 